Chapters sixty three to sixty five of Tristram Shandy, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie from William. The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, Volume two, by Lauren Stern. Chapter sixty three. Can you tell me? quoth Fritatorius, speaking to Gastiferius, who sat next to him, for one who would not apply to surgeon in so foolish a fare, can you tell me, Gastiferius, what is best to take out the fire? Ask your genius, said Gastiferius. And that greatly depends, said Eugenius, pretending ignorant of the adventure, upon the nature of the part. If it is a tender part, and a part which can conveniently be wrapped up, "'Tis both the one and the other,' replied Fidatorius, laying his hand as he spoke, with an emphatical nod of his head, upon the part in question, and lifting up his right leg at the same time to ease and ventilate it. "'If that is the case,' said Eugenius, "'I would advise you, Fidatorius, not to tamper with it by any means, but if you will send to the next printer, and trust your cure to such a simple thing as a soft sheet of paper, just come off the press, you need do nothing more than twist it round. The damp paper, quoth Yorick, who sat next to his friend Eugenius, though I know it has a refreshing coolness in it, yet I presume is no more than the vehicle, and that the oil and lamp-black with which the paper is so strongly impregnated does the business. Right, said Eugenius, and is of any outward application I would venture to recommend, the most anodyne and safe. Was it my case, said Gastrophirus, as the main thing is the oil and lamp black, I should spread some thick upon a rag and clap it on directly. That would make a very devil of it, replied Yorick. And besides, added Eugenius, it would not answer the intention, which is the extreme neatness and elegance of the prescription, which the faculty hold to be half and half. For consider, if the type is a very small one, which it should be, the sanative particles which come into contact in this form have the advantage of being spread so infinitely thin and with such a mathematical equality, fresh paragraphs and large capitals excepted, as no art or management of the spatula can come up to. It falls out very luckily, replied Fidatorius that a second edition of my treatise, the Concubinis Ritinandis, is at this instant in the press. You may take any leaf of it, said Eugenius, no matter which, provided, quoth Yorick, there is no bawdry in it. They are just now, replied Fitzgerald, printing of the ninth chapter, which is the last chapter but one in the book. Pray, what is the title of that chapter? said Yorick making a respectful bow to Fototorius as he spoke. "'I think,' answered Fototorius, "'tis that of the Re Concubinaria. "'For heaven's sake, keep out of that chapter,' quoth Yorick. "'By all means,' added Eugenius. Chapter 64 "'Now,' quoth Didius, rising up, and laying his right hand with his fingers spread upon his breast, had such a blunder about a Christian name happened before the Reformation, it happened the day before yesterday, was my uncle Toby to himself, and when baptism was administered in Latin, it was all in English, said my uncle, many things might have coincided with it, and upon the authority of a sundry decreed cases, to have pronounced the baptism null with the power of giving the child a new name. Had a priest, for instance, which was no uncommon thing, through ignorance of the Latin tongue, baptized the child of Thomas Stiles, in nomine patriae and filia et spiritum sanctus, the baptism was held null. I beg your pardon, replied Caesarius. In that case, as the mistake was only the terminations, the baptism was valid, and to have rendered it null, the blood of the priest should have fallen upon the first syllable of each noun, and not, as in your case, upon the last. 
My father delighted in subtleties of this kind, and listened with infinite attention. Gastrophiris, for example, continued Caesarius, baptizes a child of John Strudlings in Gomini Gardries, etc., etc., instead of in Nomini Padres, etc. Is it this a baptism? No, say the ablest canonists, inasmuch as radix of each word is hereby torn up, and the sense and meaning of them removed and changed quite to another object. For Gomini does not signify a name, nor Gartres a father. What do they signify? said my uncle Toby. Nothing at all, was the oric. I go, such a baptism is null, said Caesarius. In course, answered Yorick, in a tone two parts jest and one part earnest. But in the case cited, continued Carsasius, where parturi is put for patres, filia for filii, and so on, as it is a fault only in the declension and the roots of the words continue untouched, the inflections of their branches, either this way or that, does not in any sort hinder the baptism inasmuch as the same sense continues in the words as before. But then, said Didius, the intention of the priest pronouncing them grammatically must have been proved to have gone along with it. Right, answered Caesarius, and of this, brother Didius, we have an instance in a decree of the decretals of Pope Leo the Third. But my brother's child, cried my uncle Toby, has nothing to do with the Pope. "'Tis a plain child of a Protestant gentleman, Christian Tristram, "'against the wills and wishes both of his father and mother, "'and all who are akin to it. "'If the wills and wishes,' said Carsasius, "'interrupting my uncle Toby, "'of those only who stand related to Mr. Shandy's child, "'were to have weight in this matter. "'Mrs. Shandy, of all people, has the least to do in it.' "'My uncle Toby laid down his pipe, "'and my father drew his chair still closer to the table, to hear the conclusion of so strange an introduction. It has not only been a question, Captain Shandy, amongst the Vidis Winsburn on Testaments, Part 7, Paragraph 8, best lawyers and civilians in this land, continued Caesarius, whether the mother be of kin to her child. But after much dispassionate inquiry and jactitation of the argument on all sides, it has been adjudged for the negative, namely, that a mother is not of kin to her child. Vide Brook, abridged, did administer number 47. My father instantly clapped his hand upon my uncle Toby's mouth, and the colour of whispering in his ear. The truth was, he was alarmed for Lilia Bulliero and having a great desire to hear more of so curious an argument, he backed my uncle Toby, for heaven's sake not to disappoint him in it. My uncle Toby gave a nod, resumed his pipe, and contenting himself with whistling Lilia Bulliero inwardly, Caesarius, Didius, and Triptolemus went on with the discourse as follows. And this determination, continued Caesarius, how contrary soever it may seem to run the stream of vulgar ideas, it has reason strongly on its side, and has been put out of all manner of dispute from the famous case, known commonly by the name of the Duke of Suffolk's case. It is cited in Brook, said Triptolemus, and taken notice of by Lord Coke, added Didius. And you may find it in Twinburne on Testaments, said Caesarius. The case, Mr. Shanley, was this. In the reign of Edward the Sixth, Charles, Duke of Suffolk, having issue a son by one venter and a daughter by another venter, made his last will, wherein he devised goods to his son, and died, after whose death the son died also, but without will, without wife, and without child. His mother and his sister by the father's side, for she was born of the former venter, then living. The mother took the administration of her son's goods, according to the statute of the twenty-first of Harry the Eighth, whereby it is enacted, that in case any person die intestate, the administration of his goods shall be committed to the next of kin. The administration being thus, surreptitiously, granted to the mother, 
The sister by the father's side commenced a suit before the ecclesiastical judge, alleging, first, that she herself was next of kin, and, secondly, and that her mother was not of kin at all to the party deceased, and therefore prayed to court, and that the administration granted to the mother might be revoked, and be committed unto her as next of kin to the deceased by force of the said statute. Hereupon, as it was a great cause, and much depending upon its issue, and many causes of great property likely to be decided in times to come, by the precedent to be then made, the most learned, as well in the laws of this realm as in the civil law, were consulted together, whether the mother was of kin to her son, or no. Whereon to not only the temporal lawyers, but the church lawyers, the juris consulti, the juris prudentis, the civilians, the advocates, the commissaries, the judges of the consistory and prerogative courts of Canterbury and York, with the master of the faculties, were all unanimously of opinion that a mother was not of a mater non numeratur inter consanguineos, but in old si de verb signific, kin to her child. And what said the Duchess of Suffolk to it? said Michael Toby. The unexpectedness of Michael Toby's question confounded Carsasius more than the ablest advocate. He stopped a full minute, looking in my uncle Toby's face without replying, and in that single minute Triptolemus put by him and took the lead as follows. "'Tis a ground and principle in the law,' said Triptolemus, "'that things do not ascend but descent in it, and I make no doubt as for this cause, that however true it is, that a child may be of the blood and seed of its parents, that the parents nevertheless are not of the blood and seed of it, inasmuch as the parents are not begot by the child, but the child by the parents. For so they write, Liberi sunt di sanguini patris et matris, sed pater et mater non sunt di sanguini liberorum. But this, Triptolemus, cried Titius, proves too much, but from this authority cited it would follow not only what indeed is granted on all sides, that a mother is not of kin to her child, but a father likewise. It is held, said Triptolemus, the better opinion, because the father, the mother, and the child, so they be three persons, yet are they but, una caro, evide, brook, abridged, tit at ministers, number forty-seven, one flesh and consequently no degree of kindred, or any method of acquiring one in nature. "'There you push the argument again too far,' cried Didius, "'for there is no prohibition in nature, though there is in the Levitical law, but that a man may beget a child upon his grandmother, in which case, supposing the issue a daughter, she would stand a relation both of—' "'But who ever thought,' cried Carsasius, "'of laying with his grandmother?' The young gentleman, replied Yorick, whom seldom speaks of, of who not only thought of it, but justified his intentions to his father by the argument drawn from the law of retaliation. You later with my mother, said the lad, why may I not lay with yours? Tis the argumentum commune, added Yorick. Tis as good, replied Eugenius, taking down his head, as they deserve. The company broke up. Chapter sixty five. And pray, said my uncle Toby, leaning upon Yorick, as he and my father were helping him leisurely down the stairs, don't be terrified, madam. The staircase conversation is not so long as the last. And pray, Yorick, said my uncle Toby, which way is it this set affair as Tristram at length is settled by these learned men? Very satisfactorily, replied Yorick. No mortal, sir, has any concern with it, for Mrs. Shandy, the mother, is nothing at all akin to him, and as a mother is it is sure his side, Mrs. Shandy, in course, is still less than nothing. In short, he is not as much akin to him, sir, as I am. That may well be, said my father, shaking his head. Let the learned say what they will. There must certainly, was my uncle Toby, have been some sort of consanguinity betwixt the Duchess of Suffolk and her son. The vulgar are of the same opinion, quoth Yorick, 
to this hour. End of chapters 63 to 65